Pet Life Radio. This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Hello, you're listening to Animal Party on Pet Life Radio with me, Deb Wolf. And today we have a special guest. We have Suha Esadine coming to us to talk to us about way of life dog training. Welcome to the show, Suha. That's right. Thank you very much for having me. Delighted to be here. So what is way of life dog training? What's that all about? Excellent. Well, way of life dog training is the business that I started back in 2019. And it derives its name from the method that I use to work with people, which is the way of life method. And the book titled The Way of Life Method, which describes this method in detail, has been out only a few months. It was out last October, October 19, 2023. It was published and it describes in detail my approach to helping people work with dogs that display behavioral issues. But it is also a method for anyone interested in deepening their bonds with their dogs And anyone interested in getting started correctly with a new dog, new puppy, or a new rescue. So in other words, the way of life method is an approach for recovery from behavioral issues, for deepening relationships, and for raising what I call sound, strong, and spirited dogs at any age. Okay, so you're not trying to break them. You're not trying to make them just (laughs) doormats. I like that. I like that. Not um, at all. Okay, so let me ask you then, how does your style of training differ from Caesar Milan? Yes, good question. How doesn't it differ? No, no. How does, how does it, does it differ? differ? How does it differ? So, you know, I, I think anyone, all people that are talented at working with their animals, they 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 have some things in common. Ultimately, there are many things that they they have in common, but they're could also be some important differences in terms of what we're emphasizing and what we are looking at. I tend to work a lot more with the things that we don't see. I tell my clients, I want to work on those issues from the back end. So rather than working with the behavior that is presented to me and trying to change that behavior, trying to train the dog out of a behavior that I don't like, or that is causing us difficulty, or that could be dangerous or problematic behavior, rather than focus on the behavior itself, I ask questions about the way of life that is driving that behavior. And I describe what I mean by way of life. It refers to different things in the dog's overall situation, overall existence, driving the behavior. So rather than punish the dog or use behavior modification techniques to train the dog out of those undesirable behaviors, I design a way of life that makes sense to the dog, that resonates with people, that returns the power back to the guardians of the dog to regain control of that dog's behavior indirectly without trying to change the dog rather working on the situation underlying that dog's behavior. Okay, and I explain in my book and in coaching my clients what we mean by way of life. And it means four things. And things that we tend to take for granted sometimes and not give enough attention in explaining behavior and working with behavior. So one of them, for example, is how we have socialized our dog. That is, that socialization is a term that we use frequently and at the same time, fail to define properly. So I define in my book what I mean by socialization and how to go about it, especially if I'm trying to heal a dog of behavioral issues. There's a way to socialize that dog, okay? Another aspect is how we manage space, how we manage boundaries inside and outside the home. Can I take you back to the first point? Okay, so how we socialize, is that going to be things like, when we reward them with affection, when we give them food routines, or what, what is that? Excellent. So what I refer to as socialization, and it, certainly there is a place for food and rewards and where they come in. And those I would talk about under another pillar of the way of life method, which I refer to as drive development, developing drive by rewarding dogs for the behaviors that we want them to, you know, okay. 
to learn. But going back to the point of socialization, I understand socialization as exposing our dog to the world. And Deb, it actually starts with the one-on-one -on -one socialization between me and my dog, which I refer to as primordial socialization, fund, foundational, fundamental, first level of socialization. Okay, so we're talking touch, right? We're talking about touch. Touch is a part of it. Touch is a part of it. Trust is the result of me socializing my dog gradually. Trust is a result. It's not where I start. It is the result of me socializing my dog gradually, just as I explained. It is a result of designing a way of life that is appropriate for where we are in our relationship. So it can include touch, of course, Deb, but it also includes other things like all the decisions that I'm making on behalf of my dog, morning till night, where are we going? What are we doing? What is this dog seeing in the world? So for example, many of us bring a new dog home and we can't wait for everyone in our family and in our neighborhood and in our community to come and meet the new dog. The new dog may not be ready for all of this. The new dog hardly knows us, you know? So I like to spend a bit of time one-on-one -on -one with my new dog, building that rapport, building that trust, building that one-on-one -on -one relationship. And then gradually I start to take the dog to different places, expose the dog to people, other dogs and things at a distance, and then eventually getting closer to things and then eventually interacting with things. And all the while, the dog is becoming more and more comfortable with this exposure, with this socialization, because they have me to lean on, because I would be now that source of primordial comfort and primordial socialization for my dog, whereby they're like, well, I know you, and I like you well enough, so I'm going to trust what you introduce me to. So that is the socialization aspect that I talk about as being such a driver of dog's behavior. How did we go about socializing? And I explain the more gradual, maybe long-term way of going about it when many of us perhaps would rush, do too much too soon, mm -hmm. get our oh, dogs yeah. anxious, get our dogs concerned, and then potentially reactive. Well, we have to take a break. We're going to come back and hear about the other three pillars of the way of life dog training from Suha. So stay tuned, everybody, on Animal Party Pet Life Radio. And I am going to ask her a few questions, one of which was sent in by a listener about a dog and eye contact specifically. So stay tuned, Animal Party listeners. We'll be right back. Take a bite out of your competition. Advertise your business with an ad in Pet Life Radio podcasts and radio shows. There is no other pet-related media that is as large and reaches more pet parents and pet lovers than Pet Life Radio. With over 7 million monthly listeners, Pet Life Radio podcasts are available on all major podcast platforms. And our live radio stream goes out to over 250 million subscribers on iHeartRadio, Odyssey, TuneIn, and other streaming apps. For more information on how you can advertise on the number one pet podcast and radio network, visit PetLifeRadio.com slash advertise today. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Hello, we're back on Animal Party on Pet Life Radio with me, Deb Wolf. And today we have author, dog trainer, Suha Esadine, talking about the way of life. And so we're, we're going to go through three more bullet points I think she's got. Yes, that's correct. So... Let's go back to the point that you touched on earlier before the break, Deborah, which was the, you know, food and rewarding dogs with food, etc. You know, there's different points of view in the world of dog training about whether you should be using food or whether you should be using toys or praise and whether you really should be using food at all and whether that counts as bribery. You know, food is essential to that human dog relationship. Food is the most basic drive. And much of my approach is based on an understanding of how mother dogs behave with their pups, of how mother wolves behave with their cubs. And the desire for food is the first desire of a new puppy, of a new cub. And it's also the most basic drive that we can work with with a new dog 
until we have more credibility and trust and more relationship where I don't need to have food all the time to get my dog to behave or listen or pay attention. The dog is happy to behave. The dog is happy to pay attention because we would have that relationship established, but that's not where we start normally. Normally, I, I don't have a lot of relationship material with a new dog, or even if I've had my dog for a long time. Let's say I've had a dog for a long time, but they're anxious. They're very reactive. They're potentially an aggression risk. Again, in that situation, the relationship is not the full relationship that it could be. So we go back to basics and we go back to the most basic desire of a dog, which is the desire for food. We build it up. We work with it. Over time, we introduce prey which is toys and tugs and, and getting dogs engaged at that level. And according to my theory and certainly my experience, once the dog's food drive and prey drive are strong, that is when we start to see the relationship blossom. And yet many of us, we get a, a dog and immediately think that we have that relationship. We think we have that bond already. No, the bond tends to come later once those fundamental need, needs for food and prey stimulation are met. Okay, so that is the other pillar. One of the things you were talking about in the first pillar, it strikes me that you're also being an example. So once the dog trusts you, if yes. you're calm in a situation, he kind of takes his lead from that. Well, Absolutely. you're not afraid, so I won't be afraid either. Exactly. But sometimes this can backfire. <laughs> like when the person is fearful or anxious, they will often get an overprotective dog. They very well could, or a dog that is also fearful, or mm -hmm. a dog that is also withdrawn and not very confident. There is no doubt. I'm so glad you bring this up because it tends to be, and Caesar Milan certainly talks about that, right? It's about who we are and what do we represent to our dog? Are we seen as leadership material? Are we seen as a source of, of trust? Are we seen as a source of safety and guidance and comfort? And that relates to the point I made earlier about primordial socialization is that if I take my time at that level and I build that trust and that one-on-one -on -one rapport before bringing in the rest of the world into my relationship, then when it's time for us to go out there, I'm going out there with the dog that is trusting. But certainly another pillar of the method is precisely the attitude and the mindset of the human handler. And so my clients over time come to see the power that they have over their dog's mental health. So if they are steady, if they are confident, the dog will be as well. But what can happen, Deb, is that the love of our dogs, it, which is such an extraordinary bond that is universally shared, people around the world in different cultures love their dogs, and have such unique bonds with them, that bond can be a driver, can be a motivator for me to, to try to work on my own issues, right? To try to work on my own fears, insecurities, you know, ideas, sense of in which ways I could be limited perhaps, and get over some of my challenges so that I can be precisely an example for my dog, you know? Okay, so this is something I, I've shown people sometimes when I'm training a dog who's really fearful or anxious or overly aggressive. And it's almost like when you take your car to the mechanic and it won't show the problem. The car is yes. working perfectly. Because so they have this dog who's just going off. Rah, 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 rah. He's aggressive and he's nervous and his tail's tucked under and his fur's up. And the woman will hand me the leash and I'm not anticipating trouble and I'm pretty comfortable and I know that other dog that this dog is reacting to is sweet and gentle and so I'm pretty chill and immediately the dog just calms right down and the woman will look at me and say how did you do that right exactly. <laughs> they don't realize that their own fear and sometimes it's the fear of what their own dog's gonna do their own fear is like transmitted right down that leash right to that dog exactly yeah. so if they can just fake it, if they can just fake being calm, if they can just try very, very hard not to picture what could go wrong, instead <laughs> picture what will go right, the dog will calm right down most of the time. It's amazing. Agreed. And there are things that we can do outside of our interactions with our dogs and our time with our dogs to cultivate that capacity to be present, to be in the moment, to be mindful. 
to not let our minds be cluttered by thoughts of the past that are irrelevant, thoughts of the future that hasn't even happened yet, to learn from our own dogs how to be in the moment, which is another thing Caesar talks about, evidently, is this idea of they are in the moment and we also learn to be in the moment with them and not anticipate something that could happen, but to also really understand that our minds can dictate what can actually happen. So if I have a fearful mind and I'm imagining worst case scenarios, that is an almost certain way to, to bring about those scenarios that I'm, that I'm trying to avoid. Yeah, I would go one step farther. I would say that dogs are, if not truly telepathic, then almost almost telepathic. So what happens is when you picture your dog jumping up on that little old lady coming around the corner and you think, oh no, I hope he doesn't jump on her. You're actually telegraphing that yes. image. You're almost telling your dog, go jump on her. Whereas if you think, I hope he'll sit still nicely and let her pet his head, chances are he will. And it's so, so simple. But People don't get that. So we're going to help them get that. And if you're listening to the show, please stay tuned. We're going to a commercial break, but we'll be right back to talk about the last two pillars and address the question we got sent, which is about a seven-year-old dog who's been lunging, growling, misbehaving, acting aggressively toward other dogs since it was three. So four years of this. Oh, my goodness, people. Anyway, only when the other dog makes eye contact. If the other dog doesn't make eye contact, this lady says, and I've never met the dog. This is a, a sent in question. Uh, it's a shepherd husky cross. And if the, if the other dog doesn't make eye contact, everything is great. It has many, many friends, but she can't bring it to the dog park anymore. Because if anybody looks its way right in the eye, it will go off and attack them. And so we're going to talk about that when we come back from Animal Party on Pet Life Radio. Keep sending me your pet questions. We love them. Deb at Pet Life Radio. That'll get it to me, Deb at PetLifeRadio.com, and I will get your questions and put them on the air. All right, everybody, stay tuned to Animal Party. We'll be right back. Molly, here's your dinner. <coughs> Zeus, that's not your food. Don't let that happen to your precious cat. Elevate your cat's eating experience with the Cat Tree Tray. The Cat Tree Tray keeps your cat's food off the floor and conveniently located on the cat tree. It's the perfect way to eat. It's a beautiful wrought iron tray that easily attaches to your cat tree and keeps dogs and other critters out of your cat's dish. A must for multi-pet households. There's a 6-inch tray for large bowls and a 4-inch tray for smaller bowls. Purchase your Cat Tree Tray today. Go right now to CatTreeTray.com. That's CatTreeTray.com. C-A-T-T-R-E-E-T-R-A-Y.com. Let's Talk Pets. Let's Talk Pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. <laughs> Hello, you're back on Animal Party, Pet Life Radio, and we are talking about, well, we're talking with Suha Esadeen about the way of life, dog training, which is her new book, and we're just going through the pillars. We're on number three, I believe, Suha. That's right. So we talked so far about the pillar of socialization. We talked about the pillar of the handler's attitude and mindset. And we touched on drive development a little bit, Deb, as well, when we talked about building up the desire for food and building up the desire for prey and toys and games and eventually leading up to pack drive, which is the desire to please the guardian, to please the human and the human dog relationship, which comes with time. It does not come immediately. The more, the more fundamental need for food and prey stimulation need to come first before the potential for the relationship is it becomes available. So what if you have a dog who just doesn't seem interested in food Very and, good. and is not, lot. and is not going to chase that ball. I mean, I've seen these dogs. You look, you're like, what, what about affection? Can you use cuddles for these little love buckets? So, so here's the thing. I think all dogs have it in them to have a strong desire for food, okay? And there are ways to handle our dogs to start developing and revving up the desire for food, which all dogs have. It's just that some dogs sometimes are so stressed and anxious 
and potentially even overfed and over oh yes give it okay. to them for free all day exactly. long and they're not going to and, so, work and for so where's it, right? the motivation anymore yeah so we have to ask questions about that dog's relationship with food that dog's way of life more generally and when we start to tweak things in the way of life redesign that way of life and the dogs start to feel more safe and start to feel more interested in in the humans because they can tell that the humans are on their game and are and understand how to relate to their dogs that desire for food starts to emerge now the desire to play with balls or toys more generally is not common in all dogs that is certain but it's like anything else it's like any other drive it can be worked on so that the dog develops that interest to chase after balls to chase after tugs so for example one of the games that I coach my clients to work on it is the treat toss exercise where you're tossing treats and the dog is bounding after the treat, chasing after the treat. Might seem like a very simple exercise, but the dogs not only love it and not only have a chance to work for food, but they start to practice, you know, chasing, pouncing, running after something. And that is all prey type stimulation. So that is a good segue into eventually introducing tugs and introducing toys, which once you have a strong enough food drive, the desire for prey stimulation also emerges. As I explained in the way of life method, those drives emerge gradually. So Deb, I wouldn't necessarily want to compensate food and toys with affection without first trying to develop the desire for food and develop the desire for stimulation and then eventually what you will start to see is the dogs themselves becoming more affectionate seeking out your touch seeking your affection seeking your approval whether or not food or toys are available okay so the ways that we approach developing those drives is through exercise training and sport and again i detail in my book the way of life method how to layer those very important aspects of a dog's life in the direction of healing the behavioral issues that we're struggling with, of deepening our bonds, and of raising a new puppy or a new dog. So as an example, we tend to bring a new dog home and immediately start training the dog, immediately right. start teaching the dogs things. I prefer to break them into their new life, decompress them. You might have heard this expression of decompressing a new dog, giving them a little bit of time to adjust, well, the thing is, when you first bring your puppy or dog home, everything is brand new to it. Every smell, every sound, every taste, everything. It's so overwhelming. After a few days, he's used to your environment. And now you can teach him one new thing a day without kind of totally overwhelming him. So I like the idea of letting them chill. When I've sold or when I've placed rescue dogs or sold puppies in the past, oftentimes I get this call. Oh, she was so perky when we picked her out, but now she just seems to want to sleep. Well, yeah. of course, she's <laughs> she's completely overwhelmed in her new home and she needs to sleep and rest until she adjusts. And one day she wakes up and she knows all the people and she knows all the smells and she knows the stairs and it's not so overwhelming. So I think your point is really good. I do want to talk about these these people who wrote in with the Shepherd Husky Cross. So what would you help? How would you help them deal with that? If, if eye contact, the dog all of a sudden lunges and attacks and will cause a fight. If the other dog doesn't walk away, it's a fight. And she says she's just tired of being pulled around like this. Yes. And I certainly empathize with her. Shepherd Husky Cross might be quite a strong animal, especially if you're dealing with reactivity, because what can happen is that if we have a dog that is anxious and likely to react to a trigger, in this case being the direct eye contact, the eye contact is revealing to us an underlying state. And the underlying state is the anxiety that this dog might be dealing with at the moment, which actually can give the dogs even more power when they're anxious, when they're mad, it gives them even more strength, right? But anyhow, going back to the point, you know, got this person yeah, to write. No, an adrenaline on a, in a dog yes, is like, exactly. it's like, it turns your, your little scientist dog into the Incredible Hulk. Exactly. <laughs> so, so going back to this issue, whether it's being triggered by eye contact or any other issue that somebody might bring to my attention, 
you know, we can spend a lot of time trying to deconstruct why is the eye contact uncomfortable. But I would want to ask questions first about this dog's way of life. So I would sit with this family and I would ask, tell me a little bit more about how you socialize the dogs. So, for example, I'm hearing dog barks. So that is a socialization choice that may or may not be appropriate at a certain time. OK, I, would I ask- did. I did ask her some questions like, does this dog have any dog friends? And the answer was yes. Many dog friends. Apparently, it used to be a regular at the dog park. I asked her what she thought might have changed things. She has no idea. So it's, but it's years now, four years of practicing this behavior where when the dog's confronted with something it's uncomfortable with, it kind of has this little tantrum and it gets whisked away from the situation. So that's kind of a problem too, right? The more you practice the bad habit, it gets harder to break. Exactly. So that again is certainly one of the very first things that I do with a new client that I'm working with is that let us remove the dog from the situation that is causing them to display their worst behavior, the behavior that brought you to, to that brought you to me. Let's not let them practice that behavior. Let's not them let them rehearse it. But that's not enough though. We also need to ask the bigger questions about how this dog lives in general, because my entire philosophy is based on the knowledge that the dogs ultimately reflect certain ideas and practices in the four pillars in how we've managed drives and how we've socialized and how we manage space and boundaries and in our own attitude and mindset. Now, the thing is that dogs are incredibly resilient and incredibly adaptable and do want to please us. So when the dog is having issues leading to behaviors that they know cause them conflict with their humans, they don't like that. And so even if the process of change and recovery is difficult, ultimately, there's something about the way of life method that immediately resonates with the dogs and they give us another chance of turning a new page designing a different way of life, which over time, the behavior fizzles out. So instead of working on the behavior that I don't like, which in this case is reacting to eye contact, I take a step back. I get out of that situation entirely. I redesign the way of life. I give things some time. And then I have a new dog that responds very differently. You know, I will tell you, my my dogs, when they are with me at seminars, Other dogs will often try to goad them into a a conflict by seeking their eyes and trying to stare them down. Okay, so dogs, instead of falling for the behavior, right, instead of uh, uh, falling victim to the invitation, they simply look away and walk away because they have the wherewithal to do that. They're strong enough to do that. They do not wish to engage another dog at that level. So that is what I do is that I help raise a dog that is so sound, so strong that they they're not interested. They're not interested. Yeah, in if a dog that. is looking, if another dog is looking for a fight, they just they don't stoop to that level. They walk away and they come looking for me, and I take and I take over from there and deal with that. So that would be my approach to dealing with this issue because the issue is bigger than just a dog looking at them straight in their eyes and that making them uncomfortable. There are things behind the scenes that we can work on to make this dog resilient to that kind of behavior and not fall for it and become a whole other dog entirely being triggered by it. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, we're going to have to end the show here because we've run out of time, but I'd love to have you back because we never got to the fourth pillar. So you have to come back. (laughs) We can't leave people hanging. So everybody listening, if you want to know about the fourth pillar and you want to know more about the way of life dog training and hear me talking with Suha, you'll have to tune into a future show. We're going to do one very, very soon. All right, everybody. Uh, Just a couple of statistics to leave you with because I usually give you some news items. And I think I'll do that in the next show. But um, 85% of dog owners in the United States would describe their dog as a member of the family. 85%. And 76% of cat owners would describe their cat as a member of the family. So how many animals are we talking about? Well, uh, 65.1 million dogs and 46.5 million cats. 
So that's a lot of people. And that's probably the reason why this show is so popular. If you know people who love dogs and love cats, please tell them about this show. Just send them the Spotify link to Animal Party on Pet Life Radio. All right, everybody. Oh, you know what else? Kind of interesting breakdown. When they looked at generations of the pet owners, 33% were millennials, 25% were Gen X, 24% were boomers, and 16% were Gen Z, which makes Gen Z the most pet-loving generation of all because they're the smallest, and yet their numbers are really, especially considering uh, the timeline. You know, they're the least likely to own their own home, and most pet owners do own their own home. Some other stats that play into it make Gen Z's the most pet-loving ever. So I find that hopeful because that's a generation to come. All right, everybody. Uh, you've been listening to Animal Party, me, Deb Wolf, and Suha Esadine, and the Way of Life Dog Training. From me, Deb Wolf, and Suha, and Animal Party, be good to your animals. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand. Only on PetLifeRadio.com.